So we are gone live and we've opened up the room to our guests. Good afternoon. I am Linwood Sloan. Um, welcome to the 2022 first uh, exchange of the Live and Learn series. Live and Learn grew out of Dr. Joseph uh, Kelly, who was the executive director of the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. And when we chatted, he would end his conversations with the familiar folklore, well, live and learn. So we decided that we would start a series which is based on Lucille Clifton's poem, Each One Teach One, Each One Bring One Back Into the Sun. We practice the technique of the teaching table and the story circle. And so we will move around the room today and present families and their stories as we stitch together our common histories, our unique diversities, our specific cultural references, and our shared uh, space as a community, Lancaster County, exemplary of communities build common experiences like we build a crazy quilt. You may know the reference to crazy quilt, which is to stitch together all the pieces of cloth in whatever pattern they fit in to create a tapestry of the whole. And now we bring you our first engagement, which is Carl Patterson interviewing Nelson Polite, Jr. Carl? Hi, thank you, Linwood. And uh, Nelson, are you ready? Are you unmuted? Yes, sir, you are. It's good to be with you. Um, and here we're talking about the uh, journey of Abraham Polite. Um, I know it's a story with elements of diaspora, but also so many elements of consolidation and building community. So I would love it if you could start by telling us about uh, Abraham in South Carolina and uh, what he was leaving behind. I know you just had an opportunity to go down there recently. Yeah, once again, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good to see you, Carl. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, my grandfather, uh, Abraham Lawrence Polite Sr. Um, <clears throat> was born uh, 1874 in Ridgeland, uh, South Carolina. At the time, it was Beaufort County, but now they call it Jasper County. He was born um, <clears throat> uh, right on the Old House Plantation, uh, which was owned by um, Thomas uh, Wayward. He was one of the signers of the uh, Declaration of Independence. Um, he, his son, Daniel, was the one who accumulated more property, uh, 15,000 acres. Uh, this was rice land. Uh, that was the crop of the day um, at that time and then later, later on became uh, cotton. But he um, <clears throat> spent you know, his time uh, right across the street from the plantation. And then next to the house is a church. Um, so he, he was down there until age 28, 29 years old, um, still trying to discover all of what he did down there. Um, we're going to have to take another trip for that. And, um, but um, he, he came up here in 1903. But his time spent was basically working, um, you know, from the plantation. He's the first generation um, from the plantation. Uh, his parents were Robert and Charlotte polite and they actually worked for the, they called them planters at the time. Yeah, and I feel, 
I understand the uh, mystery around him. You know, what exactly was he doing down there and his whole life story. I feel like um, in the documents, obviously your father is so emphasized, but your grandfather clearly was a big mover and shaker in the background. Um, and, and I'm wondering also, um, can you tell us about his uh, journey to Lancaster, um, about the community that Abraham surrounded himself by and helped to build? Yeah, he, he uh, came up to Pennsylvania. He worked with tobacco um, and cigars in particular. And his first uh, stop was Philadelphia. Uh, he stayed in Philadelphia for a short period of time. I thought he stayed longer, but it was a short period of time. And then arrived in Lancaster in 1903. Now, I guess, I'm guessing, since he worked with tobacco so closely, that he stopped in Lancaster um, because at that time, Lancaster County was a very wealthy county uh, that produced a lot of tobacco. That, that's my guess, uh, because he did have other siblings that journeyed on to New York. Um, so, um, so when he got here, uh, I, I think what's in, in, important is he came up here with a so-called reconstruction uh, era mindset. Now, we kind of got to go back a little bit the re he was born in 1874, just at the end of Reconstruction. But it appeared as though he absorbed a lot of the um, progressive moves that the Africans made at that particular time. Uh, in particularly, uh, Robert Small. Robert Small uh, was, was one who, and, and I say that because there's a possibility that he's also related to Robert Small because Robert Small's mother, Lilia uh, Polite, was a Polite. So uh, he came up here with a progressive uh, mindset with a lot of aspirations. And can you talk to me a little bit about his uh, maybe organizational impact in Lancaster, the things he was a part of, the community uh, organizations that he kind of helped to start also? Yeah, I, I think uh, his first entryway and, and, and proudest time, I think, um, as you know, Dr. Leroy mentioned, was the church. He uh, was a member of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church for 67 years. He was a superintendent for 22 years of the Sunday school. And uh, he was a choir director of the junior choir, which I was a part of also, and the rest of my siblings, for 50 years. So, um, the, you know, he was certainly rooted into, into the church. He also, the Elks, he was one of, the, he was the last founding member uh, that passed in 1968 of the, the Elks, the Conestoga Elks, number 140. Uh, he also helped start the brother, Brotherly Love Elks in York. Uh, I think that was 1918. Uh, and then I discovered, basically by accident, that he also was instrumental in starting the Reading Elks uh, in Reading, PA. He was the last sitting member of the Negro Civic League uh, in 1923, um, which gave segue through Bethel AME Church to the NAACP. Uh, he was uh, a member, head of the Waiters Union, because uh, he worked as a caterer. Um, and he also was a member of the Dupree uh, Club, which was a democratic club connected to 
um, the political elections. He was a Democrat. And uh, in 1932, uh, uh, FDR, he came out with the New Deal. And that's when the African Americans actually became Democrats in opposed to early on, there were Republicans with Lincoln. Um, and that's just a little bit of what he he did here. Um, and and that, I mean, just to your point of having touched the community in York and in Reading, and I'm certain more organizations in more places than we um, know, he clearly had a wide impact, um, especially up here in Pennsylvania. And I, I think maybe to wrap up our conversation about him, um, what are, what are your present reflections on the life and that impact of, of your grandfather, uh, Abraham Polite? What, what are your reflections on him as you've, as you've been kind of following him and walking in his, in his trail and finding more about him? Surprised and overwhelmed <laughs> with, with, with what he was able to accomplish. But once again, he came up here with a mindset of reconstruction which was shortly right after the Civil War in 1865 to 1875. Um, but I grew up in house with him. And uh, I was there with him on the time that he, when he passed. Uh, we were all in the house at, at the time. We were able to keep him home. And, um, you know, I felt a really close connection then. Um, I also look back on this picture here in 1953, where there was a, a fundraiser um, time, fun, fundraiser. I was age three in 1953, but I remember when they came to the house uh, to take this picture, and uh, I'm there sitting on his lap. So uh, go check it out, 1953, uh, September the 25th. But my grandparents, my parents were were, were 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 good parents, and they did well by all, by all of us. But for me, uh, and I didn't realize this until later, my grandparents really were the ones who gave me a lot of nurture uh, early on, and that was very very significant. Um, so I think I think I end there. Yeah, I think. Thank you so much very much. Uh, Carl Patterson and Nelson Polite Jr. are really the seed of how this began. Nelson brought a box of photographs to Carl's desk one day. And as we looked at those photographs and moved through the, the decades that were in that cardboard box, we began to think that families across Lancaster, the county in central Pennsylvania, indeed across the United States, had in their basements, in their attics, underneath their beds, in the back of their closets, boxes and trunks and suitcases and shopping bags full of memories. And so we call this session, for those of you who just joined us, Memories at the Crossroads as we bring all of our memories together and we begin to swap stories and experiences about how we shared the common ground. Our next interview is uh, by our host, Barry from The Where will introduce himself. He's been very kind to invite us into The Where Center in Lancaster and he will be interviewing the Geisenberg family. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome you even virtually to the Ware Center, I would like to, which is the uh, one of the visual and performing arts centers uh, of Millersville University in downtown Lancaster. It sits on the traditional unceded lands of the Susquehannock people. And we make that land acknowledgement to honor the Native American practice of opening a space 
with reverence and respect. And that seems particularly appropriate today because we feel a great reverence and respect for the many cultures in this community, some of which you're gonna see represented today. Um, and we're gonna start with, uh, with this one right over here. Um, I was surprised to learn that Lancaster is one of the oldest Jewish communities in the United States of America. In fact, we have the fourth oldest Jewish cemetery in the country. And that was founded by the first groups of Jews that came through here in 1740 or so. But that group disappeared. They all moved away when really they couldn't find enough marrying partners. And the whole next wave came along in the mid 1800s. And that brings us to our guest today, Stephen Geisenberger, who will tell us a little bit about his family's history in Lancaster. So uh, my family first arrived in, uh, in 1833. Uh, or somewhere thereabouts. They've never, according to uh, Moses Geisenberg's obituary, and we've been here continuously uh, for the, for the since uh, since 1833. Uh, each of us, at least, has spent some time in the city of Lancaster, and uh, have been very involved in the Jewish community and the larger community as a whole. Do you have something to share? To share sure. Artifact? I, I, I'd like to, uh, uh, and, and I'm sure you're not going to be able to see this in in any detail. It gives you an idea of some of the things that, that uh, I, I wanted to talk about. This is a, a uh, enhanced photo of my great great grandfather. Uh, I believe it, it was they took an old photo and then they added charcoal to it uh, sometime in the 1850s. Uh, this is Moses Geisenberger came to Philadelphia uh, uh, from from uh, Biebergau uh, in Germany, and he uh, by legend peddled his cart. To, uh, to Lancaster, was a, was a street peddler for uh, the first number of years, uh, and then opened his first store in 1850. And I'll be showing you an artifact from that uh, later. From Moses, from Moses, we have the, the, uh, the Geisenberger family tree, which you can't see uh, all of it. And I also have a little bit of some research we had done in Biebergau, Germany, of Geisenbergers that preceded Moses. but. Uh, Everything over to here, about half of this tree, uh, is is uh, families that that spent a considerable amount of their at least their childhood uh, here in Lancaster County. So uh, we have a, a long, rich history here. Great, thank you, Steve. And we're going to talk a little bit about that history uh, in more detail right now as we bring up the subject of community. And the Geisenbergers have been deeply involved in this community in so many different ways. For example, the very first. Jewish student at Franklin and Marshall College here in Lancaster was one of the Geisenbergers. Uh, but that all began with Moses, as you just heard. And so Stephen's going to share a little bit of more of the history of his role in the community. Yeah, I thought I would, I would uh, come up here. I don't know if you can see, but this was my, uh, my great great grandfather Moses's initial business, business card. Uh, he had a dry goods store called the Golden Lamb. Uh, first was on the uh, 100 block, or actually the 0 100 block of North Queen Street. Then he moved up the street, uh, right next to the what was generally known as the old Y uh, on the on the 100 block, uh, and that's where he, he spent the second half of his career uh, with the Golden Lamb. Uh, he was in business about 50 years. Uh, somebody bought him out of business, but that business, of course, is long gone. And the uh, Hagers and the Watt and Chans and those folks uh, eventually won out on that on that war. Um, you know, in terms of, of community, it, it's it's very difficult as almost to where to start. I mean, my my great grand great great grandfather Moses was very involved in the Board of Trade, which is the predecessor of the Lancaster Chamber of Commerce, which has its 150th uh, anniversary coming up. It, it, actually, we're in the 150th year, uh, and and because Moses was involved in that initial Board of Trade, uh, that I'm I'm a co-chair uh, for that for that uh, celebration that's coming up over the course of the next year. Yeah, and I think that leads us to the next topic, which is the service of the Geisenberg families in this community, which is huge, far spreading and caused mul through multiple generations. And you can tell us a little bit about Lionel and, the, and what right. he did. So this is my great grandfather, uh, Lionel Geisenberger. And Lionel was uh, Moses' son, uh, and he was an attorney in Lancaster, the first of three generations of attorneys himself, his son, Jack Geisenberger Sr., and his uh, grandson, and my father, Jack Geisenberger Jr. Uh, Lionel was the, the uh, president. Actually, he was the grand rudrut of the Royal Arcanium. Uh, 
which is which a national organization. I didn't know it still exists today. Uh, I don't know that anybody followed in his footsteps from the family on that, but uh, for two years he was he was the national leader. Uh, you know, with with the advent of of newspaper research and newspapers.com uh, and Ancestry, you're able to do a lot of this research on uh, of old newspapers. And the number of articles when, where he went from town to town around the country speaking, uh, I haven't even been able to clip close to all of them. But I did bring, uh, in addition to this caricature of, of uh, Lionel, which appeared in the 1916 newspaper, uh, it talked about Lionel. Um, and, uh, they used to have a guy who did caricatures. I don't know if he did it every month or whatever, but did a real nice job with my great great with my great grandfather. I also have this watch which he was presented for uh, when he was the uh, Grand Rogret of the uh, uh, Arcanium. And this watch, uh, I don't wear it often. I just so happened to find a, a, a suit pocket, a, a pants pocket today. I don't know if you can get that, 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 had, that has a watch pocket. So uh, I thought I'd, I'd wear it today and it still works. So, and this is, this is Lionel and his four, four sons. And we'll maybe talk a little bit about some of those sons. Yeah. And, and I think uh, Steve's being actually very modest about his family service to the community, that everything from presidents of the synagogues to the bar association, there's been much, much more. And his mom was mother of the year and whatnot. But along with the services, the idea of fellowship and fraternalism. And uh, may we talk a bit briefly about the Elks? Yes. Um, so uh, this is, this is uh, trying to get, give every, uh, everybody a little bit of, of, of uh, press time here today. And this is my grandfather, who I who I did know. Unfortunately, he uh, he died uh, two I died prematurely of a heart attack in his late 60s. Uh, I was only about 12 years old. Unfortunately, did get to spend some time with him. But a tremendous guy. Um, and uh, early on in life, he uh, got involved in service. And one of the first things that he did was he he came up through the Elks organization, became the the uh, Exalted ruler. They had great titles for people back in those days. You know, he was the exalted ruler of the Elks. And uh, in 1937, they hosted the year that he was the exalted ruler. The Elks hosted a statewide convention, uh, which drew many, many, many people to to, uh, to Lancaster County and specifically the Old Brunswick Hotel. Uh, and this is a pro, actually a copy of the program. I donated the original program from that. Uh, to the Elks uh, last year, but he was also president of the Art Association, the Bar Association. Uh, um, he was involved in uh, president of the Lions Club, was leader in the Lions Club. So he had a tremendous number of of, uh, of things that he did. I was, I was joking earlier that uh, Moses, Lionel, and my grandfather all had first page obituary. Um, unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen with my dad. I doubt it'll happen with me. But uh, they were they were all ver and they and not because they of their professional achievements so much as their as their service to the community. Yeah. And um, what's nice is sometimes some of the synergies and collaborations that happen in this community. So, for example, Nelson Plate was so important in the establishment of the Christmas Attic Center. But I know that the Geisenberg family was also. Uh, but going away from um, the city itself, how about more, let's talk a little bit more about the family. What are some of the kinds of celebrations, the gatherings that you all have together? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that, they, that, that uh, I was asked to talk about a little bit is, is you know, where, when, when do we get together? And typically it is the Jewish holidays, uh, the high holidays in the fall, uh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. Also, we try to have a Passover seder together, celebrate things like uh, bar mitzvahs. Uh, this is this is what I would say. I guess remains of the Lancaster branch of the family. Uh, this was a picture taken at a bar mitzvah with both my parents, uh, their four children, my, my, obviously my three siblings and myself, and also the eight grandchildren uh, that we've produced for, for them. Unfortunately, neither of my parents are still alive. Otherwise, uh, my father would be probably better to speak on these issues than myself. But uh, uh, you know. That's and and the other time we always get together, frankly, is you know it's not a Jewish holiday; it's the night before Christmas, uh, because that's when uh, everybody's off work the next day. So, uh, and that goes back, you know, in in, in, the, in the Jewish tradition for a long time in the United States, as what we call uh, assimilated Jews, uh, which are which 
which our family, um, you know, very strongly believe that you assimilated into the community. You didn't try to stand apart from the community. Uh, so we were always uh, involved. You talked about some of the Jewish holidays and ceremonies. So I think it's a good place to end our, our, our look at your family uh, with the topic of worship. And you have a really interesting artifact here to share. Yep, I'm not going not gonna to pick this up, but uh, lucky enough, I, I got the family Bible passed down to me. Uh, I don't know if it's the only family Bible. Uh, this is a, a leaser Bible, a lesser Bible. He was a rabbi in Philadelphia. Uh, I imagine this came from my great great grandparents and all the birth dates, death dates uh, of all the members of my family are in this Bible. There also was a, not this family tree, but actually my great grandmother's family tree. When I opened the family Bible up, there was a, there was, there was this, which was, which was their family tree. And I was able to develop that genealogy. And that's really, these documents really got me interested in the genealogical process. Uh, um, my great great grandfather has an interesting history there. Uh, he uh, he took tablets that had been in the that had been in the possession of of a prominent Jew in Lancaster County who passed away uh, to Philadelphia and gave it to the to the uh, Jewish Hospital of Philadelphia. And about in, it was the year two thousand. I was invited to a ceremony. I said, "What are you inviting me for?" Well, your great great grandfather gave the gave these tablets to to this. Uh, to this synagogue and we're rededicating it. And uh, so that's what this artifact is here, which shows the tablets, maybe not so great. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my great grandfather was involved in the building of the temple. He's on the cornerstone. And uh, my great, great grandmother was the president of the women's auxiliary commission, the first president and did that until her death. So we've, we've been very involved in the community. Thank you so much, Stephen. In fact, his family's been featured in this book, which is the Jews of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There's a lot about the Geisenbergers there because they are indeed the longest continuous Jewish family in this community. Thank you so much for being part of today. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, could I ask you one quick question, Steve? Uh, how many pieces do you have in your family collection? How come we can't hear them? If you care to guess how many individual items you have in your family collection, maybe 50. And where do you keep them? Oh. I unmuted it. Muted? I didn't mute it. So we're going to talk about where to keep these archives and, and where to uh, store and how to store these things during the state workshop. Forgive me for pulling my mask down. For those of you who have joined us virtually, we are at Millerville University's Ware Center in Lancaster, and we are following COVID protocol that all the speakers in the room are wearing their masks. Forgive me for not revealing myself. Hopefully I can reveal my intention to you, if not my face. Uh, I was very excited about Dr. Hopkins uh, pulling me by my coattail and saying, wait a minute, is he talking about the Geisenbergers who started the, um, the Christmas Attic Center? Uh, it is our intention to reveal the six degrees of separation of all of these families as they move through a community, contribute to that community and build on that community. But I asked Dr. Hopkins to also speak about those of, who are educators and who continue the continuity of cultures through the establishment of educational pedagogy, classroom exchange and cultural development. And so as the camera swings around, we will be joined 
by Dr. Leroy Hopkins. Leroy Hopkins is a living legacy and a national treasure. Don't go anywhere. Dr. Hopkins, would you share some time with Dr. Hopkins? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm here in place of Mrs. Beam, who's too, her health is too precarious to come out. Uh, she's in her 83rd year. Uh, Lancaster County was erected in 1729. A couple of years after that, the Beam family came and settled in the area of Ephrata. Uh, Muddy Run was the church that they helped organize, Muddy Run Lutheran Church. Uh, Richard Beam was born in 1925, February 15th. Uh, he, he always said that he was a day late for Valentine's Day. And uh, uh, as a child, he, as a baby, he was very frail. As a result of his frailty, he, he uh, adopted the name Bishley Knippley, which means a little piece uh, in Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, he attended uh, Ephrata High School, graduated from high school in 1943, and was drafted into the army. And as he said, because of his knowledge of German, he heard Pennsylvania German at home. His grandparents spoke it, but they stopped speaking around him when he, they realized that he understood what they were saying because they used it to hide things from him. So it, he was uh, spared going to the Battle of the Bulge. And then after the war, he attended uh, Franklin Marshall College where his German teacher was J. William Fry. Now, J. William Fry's son, Alan, was my high school classmate. Uh, while he was at Franklin and Marshall, uh, Professor Beam, and I'll call him Herr Beam, which is the name he, he chose, uh, he, he focused on German, and especially German dialectology. Uh, he had the opportunity because of uh, William Fry. The name William Fry should be known to our audience. In 1945, he started Brunswick Tours, which was the beginning of Amish tourism in the county. Uh, and J. William Fry was a very talented person. He spoke fluent German, French, Spanish, and Russian, played the piano and also the guitar. Under his direction, uh, Dick Beam went to the University of Marburg, Philippe's Universität Marburg an der Lahn, and spent a, a number of years working in the Sprachatlas. A Sprachatlas is a institution that studies the distribution of language of vocabulary. In some parts of Germany, for example, the word for a butcher is Fleischer, but in other parts it's Metzger. And so at the Institute, they studied the distribution of German words, not only in Europe, but also in Latin America, Asia, and in North America. And uh, after his studies at the Sprachatlas, uh, Professor Beam then was able to spend two years at the University of Vienna studying under a Professor Kanzmeier, who was a dialectologist. Uh, and he started uh, his graduate work at uh, Penn State. Uh, professor Buffington was one of his professors. And it was at Penn State that he became, began his lifelong uh, pursuit of, of knowledge. Uh, he began uh, compiling a comprehensive English to Pennsylvania German, Pennsylvania German to English dictionary. And we have some pictures of that. Uh, it is a 12 volume work. It took him over 50 years to compile it. <clears throat> and the amazing thing is he used this personal interest to educate students. Uh, I was somewhat helpful. Uh, as I mentioned, he got me hired at Millersville, or at least told me about the opportunity. And in 1985, he applied to the Max Cotta Foundation. Max Cotta was the chemist who developed Pertussin and of course made him a multimillionaire. And uh, money was given to promote German and American understanding. And so uh, Professor Beam applied to and got $10,000 from the Cotta uh, Foundation and began the Pennsylvania Study, uh, Center for Pennsylvania German Studies at Millersville. Now, the project was not really that favorable to the university. Uh, it seemed like dialect was something that was not uh, you know, the latest thing. Uh, it was different with the, the, the president of the Millersville College. When I was a student, 
uh, Dr. Luke uh, Bemisdorfer, who was fluent in the in the dialect. And uh, Dick, uh, the last 30 years of his life felt a sort of strange because the university was really not interested in what he was doing. But at that institute, which is now housed in his home, it would fill this room. It's about nine cubic feet of, uh, of materials. Uh, he spent the majority of his adult life writing columns for the budget, which is a Mennonite publication. He did radio uh, performances with uh, uh, Brendel. Uh, he edited the Brendel collection on folklore. Uh, he published a lot of reprints. Uh, at his center, uh, we had uh, some of my students ended up working and then acquiring professional skills. One, Joshua Brown, is now the associate professor of German at the University of Wisconsin and is also the editor of the uh, Journal of the Society for German American Studies. The Society for German American Studies was, was co-founded by Dick Bean. He was the treasurer for 10 years. And in 1988, uh, he was instrumental in bringing one of their most successful conferences to Millersville. It was the 300th anniversary of the Germantown protests against African slavery. And I was one of the co-presenters. Uh, and uh, the other keynoter was uh, Don Yoder, who had been one of Dick Beam's uh, professors at Franklin and Marshall. Don Yoder went on to University of Pennsylvania and is probably the Dean of Pennsylvania German folklore. Uh, he was the one who's written uh, important works about powwowing. And uh, uh, the relationship I had with Dick Beam was a special one. Uh, because he encouraged me in my research in African-American history and also Afro-German history. And I was very much interested in what he did with the Pennsylvania German uh, culture because in my mother's family, uh, my grandmother, her name was Elnora Stump, S-T-U-M-P-F. And her mother, my great-grandmother, was uh, Elizabeth Warner or Werner. And uh, my mother in my childhood used German words. Uh, and I, 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 I explained those to uh, Dick Beam, and he was, he was amazed also. Uh, and I recently gave a talk about that. But what, as I remember Dick Beam, was that he was always committed to students and to his craft. Uh, he, he loved the language. Uh, his, as he became, uh, his health became somewhat frail. Uh, he had a fall, broke his leg and uh, it was a long rehab. And typically, he chose a rehab center near Ephrata. Uh, the address is Offen Katzenbuchel, on top of the, the cat's back, and all the staff there speak Pennsylvania German. So he was in, he was in heaven. For the, he was there for, I think, three weeks and 24 seven in the language. And uh, that sort of dedication was something that I really admired. And he was, he was more than a friend. He was a mentor. And as I said, he was uh, sort of like my father, academic father. Okay. Okay, uh, you're gonna show the picture of the church? Well, he was he was buried out of that church, uh, Muddy Muddy uh, Creek, and uh, on his tombstone uh, is the inscription: "Ich wäre so gern, ich wäre so gern daheim. I would be so glad, so glad to be at home." Written in Pennsylvania Dutch, and it's uh, a song, and we sang that at his funeral. And I should add, one of the images is of his mother. He had a special relationship to his mother, a Marcella uh, uh, Bean. And that's going to be one of the images. Doctor, I, th I think because of uh, our technical situation, we, don't, uh, we weren't able to cue your images up in time. But I thank you very much, uh, uh, especially for the 
the conversations about where his life touched other lives and also touched your life and launched your study of, of uh, German. We'll now go to Brian and Kim Williams who are remote and they will share with us uh, uh, the interview with the Lafia family. We'll uh, end before the workshop with uh, the Dixon family speaking about Nelson Polite Sr. And then we'll introduce our guests from the State Archives. Thank you very much, Doc. Brian and Kim, take it away. Right. Well, good afternoon, our friends down in Lancaster and fellow history detectives, uh, that uh, Leroy being with the Mod Squad down in Lancaster and the Commonwealth Monument Project up here in Harrisburg. We've had an opportunity to meet some really fascinating people and in interviewing them. And we're going to introduce another family from Lancaster County, uh, Mr. Durla and Mrs. Shoba Lathia. Uh, and uh, they're going to present uh, some artifacts that they have as well as everyone else has. And uh, we'll just, Kim and I will probably just do a tag team, change them back and forth, asking certain questions to the Lathia and uh, family. And they, they're familiar with uh, what sort of items that uh, we discovered when we met them the first time. And we'd like to add that Mr. and Mrs. Lafayette are the first of their generations to come to the United States. And uh, we'd like to begin by saying, you know, where did you grow up? Obviously they grew up in India, but then they came to the United States and we will leave it to them to enlighten us about uh, when they came to be in Lancaster County and how many generations are there now, et cetera. Mr. and Mrs. Lathia. Thank you, good afternoon. It's been really pleasure to join the entire group. Gives us an opportunity to uh, focus on how the first generation Indian families and settlement that came to uh, Central Pennsylvania, especially in Lancaster County. Me, myself, uh, I grew up in a small town that was adjacent to uh, Mumbai, at that time called Bombay, by the, the British uh, settlement over there. Uh, I went to a school, graduated from, from the school, went to University of Bombay, graduated as a civil engineer, and then came to United States in 1968 to study the higher education for my master's degree in uh, civil engineering. Uh, I came to Central Pennsylvania in 1969 and my wife Toba, she joined me in 1972. Uh, we have been living in Central Pennsylvania for about uh, 50 plus years, especially in Lancaster County for 38 years. Uh, prior to that, we lived in uh, City of Harrisburg, also lived in Colonial Park and Pendrew. So we consider Central Pennsylvania is our home. Lancaster is the, the most lived home. We have been very pleased with living in Lancaster County and uh, we are part of the society. We, as I said earlier, we are the first generation uh, Indian settlement. Our both children, two children that we have, a son, Justin Lathia, and Julie Lathia. Uh, both of them were born in Central Pennsylvania. Julie was born in uh, while we were in Lancaster. Lancaster. Uh, Justin was born when we were in uh, Harrisburg. Uh, Harrisburg area. So beyond that one, uh, Shobha, do you want to add anything to that one uh, about uh, how you grew up and what you did here in Lancaster area? I came relatively young uh, in age, so I feel more United States as my home. Now, it definitely the culture of India and those influences year I was there shaped me to who I am. But I think I I think I'm more American than I'm Indian. And is how I feel. And uh, 
No, I'm I'm very very elated to be in Lancaster area, Lancaster County. I'm very very happy, and uh, uh, farmland and uh, the way this community is, it's very very important to me. And the way they have accepted the the newcomer like us in Lancaster County, we were extremely pleased. And I always tell people around us around in Elizabeth Town where we live, if we lived here in Lancaster County for 38 years, I think we are uh, Indian Dutch, like the Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> we are Pennsylvania Dutch people. <coughs> Do you, um, did your children marry um, Americans? Or not Americans, but we're all Americans. But did your children marry non-Indian? Yes. Uh, both of our children are married to non-Indian. Uh, Daughter-in-law uh, is uh, originally raised in Long Island. She is fourth generation Italian from Long Island. And uh, uh, our son-in-law is a Southern boy. He's from Oklahoma. And uh, I think part of his uh, relatives are from Arkansas as well. So uh, yes, uh, daughter Julie is married to Joel Bennett. And our son, Justin, is married to Amanda Tiffany Lafia. So as you can see that uh, our generation has completely melted in the American society and the American life. Uh, for, for the other historical researchers that are out there, when Kim and I met the Lathias the first time, uh, one of the most important things we always look for is uh, the genealogy side uh, of individuals. And in this case here, we actually uh, uncovered an interesting uh, family uh, researcher that uh, the Indian uh, people seem to have. So what we found that... Uh, if they so choose. If they so choose, that's correct. Right. Um, because we were wondering when there is a cremation, uh, how does one log that death uh, in a family genealogy tree and how is that done? So we find that um, they actually, the family uh, has a professional, what they call a panda, who is a researcher or family for the family. Or I believe you had another name for it, Mr. Lath. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's a panda is the right word. I think that's the right word that they maintain the family okay. for generations. Okay. And so maybe you can just touch on what that panda is. Just for a moment, do. yes. Yeah, yeah so let me give you a little background on that one. Um, it's very interesting how the family history has been preserved for probably centuries. Because when people, let's say 200, 300 years ago, when they were born, there were no records of their birth at the municipal or government level. So, Let's say if somebody would get married at that time, the panda would come to the wedding uh, and then people who are present over there who have new children born, they will write their names into that book. And then they would also show the names of the, the grandfather to great grandfather to the children. And when their children to children, when they were born and during any ceremony, the same panda families will appear again with the book and they will enter the new generation in that. I personally experienced when my grandmother passed away and we were doing some ritual in a small town. I went over there and met with the panda and I was really shocked or surprised when he opened the book. I could see practically 300 years ago who our ancestors were, that he, they were maintaining the books. And the pandas will maintain the books and pass through their generations. So there are panda generations maintaining the book. So that's how the family genealogy has been maintained. It's pretty amazing. 
It's amazing. Thank you for enlightening us. Uh, Go ahead. For service um, in the community, uh, whether that being with a religious organization or let's say a uh, social organization, can you just touch on some of the service that your family has done in the Lancaster area? Now, uh, yeah, let me begin. I served in the state government in Pennsylvania. I worked with the State Department of Highways, State Department of Transportation and environmental protection for over 34 years. And during that time, I met with the, the very fine people of Pennsylvania in the government sector, in the private sector. And I always enjoyed working with the, government, uh, with the pen, uh, people of Pennsylvania. I also belong, we also belong to an organization called uh, IOLC, which is the Lancaster-based um, uh, uh, Indian organization, which is um, involved in many civic uh, activities. And as part of that, I also served as an auxiliary judge to the science fair that is conducted by the uh, Lancaster County school system. So beyond that, uh, Shobha, you want to touch base with our children? Yes. Uh, growing up, our children in this area were very very heavily involved in uh, various uh, community service activities. Uh, Justin was part of a key club and also Dimale, which is a Mason organization sure for the youth. Uh, Dimale uh, also, yeah. um, he did a lot of uh, service work in college when he was at college with the Circle K. And uh, I think at some point he was a Lieutenant Governor for Circle K. Our daughter, Julie, uh, went to um, do her community service at Masonic Homes. And uh, I think she has close to 150 hours of community service there and uh, also got the scholarship for them. Uh, for myself, I have always been very fascinated with children and uh, one of the organizations that I was involved with here in Lancaster area is called Lancaster's uh, Children's Playroom. And uh, uh, here is a, I, I was very much interested in young children and mother sent me a card thanking her and uh, some of the work I have done. Uh, I was with them for nine years, and uh, these are some of the things that come to my mind. Our daughter also was intern at, um, um, I guess, uh, for uh, Senator Ireland Specter and uh, in Washington, uh, Washington D.C. So uh, she also has a fond memory. Now, one of the things that we are really very much proud of are uh, uh, back home in India, um, my late aunt uh, won a uh, Rolex award for enterprise in 2006. And her name is Chanda Shroff. And what she did was uh, help 22,000 women in India to earn an income from an embroidery. And these are the pieces of embroidery. And work these that... are the, if you look at the work, it's so intricate. I cannot tell you. If you look at the back side of it, do you, yeah, I just want to show you that. Look at the back the side of embroidery. Work. What a clean and neat work that these women have done. And, uh, that makes us very, very happy. The that one our... that I'm, I'm wearing, this one is also a piece that our organization made. It. These are the kind of work that they did. And uh, we are very proud of uh, coming from a family and genealogy that is involved in service. Thank you very much. Um, so you were, you are, um,
Can't hear you. You went mute. Something went wrong. Uh, you, you push the button on the mute. You are on mute now. Uh, Brian and Kim, you are on a mute. We are also on the mute. No, okay, no. we're good. Okay, now oh, you are on now. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Could you tell us a little about your faith and fellowship? Uh, yes. Um, here yes. in central Pennsylvania area, uh, by faith, we are Hindu. We were raised Hindu. And uh, part of our family is, uh, this is our, uh, uh, I guess, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita Bible. which is sort of our Bible. Bible. And uh, part of our family now also uh, definitely goes to church. And so we have a mixed faith, but uh, our temple here, there is no Hindu temple. Mm -hmm. It is in New Cumberland and surrounding area. So uh, our place of worship is in New Cumberland, uh, Pennsylvania, and that's where we go for our worshiping. Again, you're on mute. Oh, no, we're not. We're not. We're good. Okay. okay, now we can hear you. Can you, you hear us? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So our, uh, just, talk, just touching on your uh, worship and praise, let's say, in New Cumberland, um, do you have any specific important days that you celebrate? That you celebrate. Yes. Uh in the spring, a festival of color, which most of the people are familiar with, is, is a, a very it's a welcoming spring and uh, it is a, a colorful festival. Uh, another big day that is very important to us is Diwali. Diwali is... Uh, it's like the end of the year, like the Christmas that we have at the end of the Hindu calendar. And uh, uh, Diwali is very important to us. Another festival that uh, we follow is Karvachat, which is uh, uh, fasting for your husband's long life. And uh, that is also very important. And uh, Hindu calendar have a lot of, lot of uh, holy days. So those are the thing. And another thing, that our family follows is uh, definitely uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> Two very days. Yeah, here is an example photograph of our Thanksgiving dinner where yeah. our whole family celebrates just like the local Thanksgiving. And uh, Christmas as well, because we all along, as I said, uh, we have we've been raising children in this country, so it was very important for us to teach them. Even though we weren't going to church, we even put out nativity scene that Christmas is all about Christ's birth, and so on and forth. And now, obviously, daughter-in-law and grandchildren, and uh, also son-in-law and their children uh, are exposed to church. Yeah. So it's a fusion of two cultures. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Do, do you wish to share with any of us uh, any other artifacts that you may have? There some with of you? the things that are very important to us are our ritual, and some of them you may be very much familiar with. At the time of the wedding, the henna that is put on mm -hmm. is uh, also very, very uh, important tradition and uh, even to a day we follow this is another uh, important tradition this is rangoli uh, rangoli is a design that's um, made on a flat surface it can be used uh, I mean made with grains flower petals uh, colors uh, traditionally really a sand color sand is what they use that is also carried forward, and I would like to show them mode. Um, this is also, uh, in India, this is 
called mode. Mode is a head. wedding crown, not worn by a bride, but bride's mother. And mm. uh, this is our daughter-in-law, Amanda's picture. Uh, she was part of some ritual and she wore the mode, which was my mother's mode. And this was such a big thing to me. I, I was even afraid to mention and, and suggest her that she wear mode. And she says, mom, where is my crown? And I was like, okay, you want to wear it? And uh, so this is that. And this is a wedding coconut, which is a very important thing. Wedding oh, coconut is a coconut uh, wrapped in a fabric with a uh, betel nut on it and a coin is in the fabric. And that is right here used at the time of the wedding that is joel and julie's wedding and joel is holding that coconut so uh, uh these are some of thank the you very much mr and mrs lafia we appreciate it. thank All you here. very much uh being Our from pleasure. new orleans and jamaica the coconut is very important as a gift several times a year we wrap yeah. the coconut and present it. This is coconut season, also known as Mardi Gras. Mardi yeah. Gras began yesterday on the Feast of the Epiphany, January 6th. So many things we have in common, so many things that we have unique. Thank you very much, Lafayette family. I would like to ask for your permission and Randy Harris's grace and guidance to come and photograph the items on your table so that we can add them to our memory box and collection. And perhaps Brian and Kim can connect with Randy and we can arrange a time. We've already done that, Landwood. We're squared away. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm standing at the table of uh, Patty and uh, Terry Dixon. Uh, and I think you need to turn on your mic. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm standing at this incredible uh, table. We uh, will end our part of the presentation and go to the workshop by uh, suggesting to the State Archives collection uh, a way of helping the polite family with such an incredible number of archives and artifacts that they uh, have kept from Nelson Polite Sr. I want to introduce Patty uh, Polite Dixon, Nelson Polite Sr.'s daughter. And Patty, I'm standing here in the family section of your table. Could you tell us what these items are? Well, we have pictures of um, my father and his sister when they were just kids. And here's another picture of my father and his sister. Um, they were uh, about two years apart in age where the older children in the family, his brothers and sisters were, I think, were 10 years older than them. So they were, and when he was born, they called him the new babe because there was 10 years between him and, and the next sibling. So um, that, those two were very close as they grew up. There's a picture of, of, of um, my parents and my brother, Nelson, who I don't know if he's still with us, but Nelson and, um, and my sister. Picture. And here's a picture of Nelson when he was just a baby. Um, we found these things. Um, Tell us about the family Bible. Well, this, this Bible is actually the family Bible from my grandmother, Blanche Mildred Richardson Polite, um, Abraham's wife, my father's mother. This is the family Bible that was, we found that was from her family. And it, this, uh, it has a family record of births and deaths uh, of her parents, her grandparents, and, and things like that. So that's what that is. And we will talk about the condition of this Bible uh, after the workshop by the state. But let's walk down to the other end of the table. And Terry, will you tell me about these, these books? OK, I think we have uh, Nelson Polite's uh, graduating uh, yearbook from McCaskey High School, our alma mater. Uh, Brother Polite and his sister Omi's uh, yearbook as well. Uh, in particular, of particular notice is that Brother Polite was uh, recognized for perfect attendance 
in school, and he was very proud of that, and I was able to discern this little uh, certificate amongst many of the other little objects that I found up in the attic. I just want to say one thing about the family historians. Keep in mind that each family has someone that uh, has a particular access to different items. Hold on to those items. It's, it's so important. And uh, Nelson Polite was one that never got rid of anything, and he stored the majority of these artifacts and, and uh, certificates up in the attic, and it took me approximately uh, almost a year to go through each one of these little items he had stashed away up in the, in the attic. But hold on to these items. It's a lot of historical information that could be shared amongst the family. This is the photo of uh, uh, Nelson Polite, and I often refer to uh, Brother Polite because we're both uh, Masonic brothers in the Masonic Lodge, and uh, he was very uh, prolific in the Masonic Lodge. Uh, we talked about uh, Abraham Polite when uh, your brother Nelson mm -hmm. began our, our cycle, and we have this picture that I wanted to share and show, and forgive me for not having on the proper gloves. I know my archivist friends <laughs> would say, why are you touching that? And we'll, we'll, this picture, uh, which is uh, the annual Thaddeus Stevens Memorial uh, Gravesite, um, uh, tilt it this way. How's that? This placing of wreath at Thaddeus Stevens' gravesite here. We'll ask you to go on to the African American Historical Society's website where you can find out more about Patty Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith's uh, grave sites. I wanted to also talk about service uh, uh, to community. And we have some really incredible examples of the lifetime of service of um, Nelson Polite Sr. And I wanted to start here, Patty, with his, with his Boy Scout uniform. Would you tell us about this? Yes, yes, so. He was a Boy Scout. Um, he spent many years um, with the Boy Scout. I know there are uh, still men in this community, some of them, many of them in their 80s now, who talked about my father um, when he used to take them to camp when they were just boys. And we found many of them, um, like I said, this is just a very small piece of the artifacts that we found. We found many pictures of, of, the, of the boys who were in scouting with him. We have pictures. And, and so he did, and he spent uh, many, many years on the local council's uh, executive board until he passed. He was a member of the Boy Scouts executive board where he received the top honor of a Silver Beaver Award for his service uh, for the many, many years in, in scouting. So he did, he, he really did like scouting. And we also know that he served his country. Here we have uh, this incredible uh, coat from his um, service in the, in the country. Uh, our history detectives looked at this coat and uh, went wild. We discovered, for example, this emblem, which is called the ruptured duck. And would you tell us about the ruptured duck? Yes, the ruptured duck would... Uh... Actually, it depicted an eagle inside of a, of a circle, and that uh, showed that the person was honorably discharged from the military during World War II. But that was fascinating for me, and also the fact that uh, the stripes on the side, I retired from the military after 22 years, but we'd always have the large insignia to indicate the amount of years, but they had it broken down through the months as well, so I thought that was interesting for me coming from the uh, historian's perspective. So those of us who have not served, this would show one year and two months of service. He went on to join the uh, American Legion. And uh, would you talk about this uniform? Uh, this uniform I've seen with uh, Brother Plight in several pictures, but uh, he and uh, Leon Glover, which was his best man at his wedding, uh, wore these uh, uniforms with, with dignity. I've seen some beautiful pictures with Brother Plight with him and his wife. But Brother Plight, he was a true, true patriot. He loved his country. He loved the military. And he was particularly at the head of it was his family and God. Yeah. And this uh, uh, American uh, Legion uniform we found complete with its 
cap in its pocket. <laughs> it's a tie, a, 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 a really incredible everything, sign. Everything. Everything. They have as, the pants and everything. As, as we did his Elks marching band uniform. Yeah. Um, and would you tell us about his... his uh, <laughs> Time as a marching. My my a father musician. was in the, the 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 Elks, the local Elks, um, had a drum and bugle corps, and I don't know if Leroy was a part of that or not. But um, they used to win prizes. They went all over the state of Pennsylvania, and um, they marched and 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 they were very very good. And he was he was a part of that for many many years. And on the table we have his coronet that he played in that band, and also that he, he played taps course. with. And uh, in the kind of antique road show where we found a case, the horn, and even the original valve oil that was in the box, as we did his weapon. Would you tell us, Terry, about the weapon? Yeah, Brother Clark was a, an avid hunter, uh, small game primarily, but him and a group of uh, gentlemen that uh, kind of took him under their wing and uh, they went out hunting. Uh, Patty can probably elaborate better than me what the type of game that they bought back and why she uh, had a negative uh, look at some of the food that they bought back. <laughs> yeah, my father and um, some older men in the community, I think, when, you know, we have to understand when my father was born, his father was, was probably in his 50s. So he was, a, he was an older man. So I, I, what I believe happened was there were some younger men in the community like John, John Hillary and, and uh, Fats Craig and some of those men kind of took my dad under their wing um, as he was growing up. They taught him to hunt, they taught him to fish, and they taught him some of those types of things. And um, so every year after Thanksgiving, uh, he would go out with those guys and, and they'd go out and they, they would hunt. And they'd bring home rabbits and pheasants and like I said, mostly small game. But um, he would pull that old rifle out every year and, and they would go out and hunt and, 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 and they would also hunt and, and fish. So many, many items and in so many conditions. We'll end with, a, with a, a brief discussion of his distinguished service in the Masonic Lodge, in the Elks, and in the Shriners. Well, I can elaborate on the, uh, the Masonic side, and I also have a, a, a brief overview of, of what he did in the Elks. But as far as uh, the, the Masons were concerned, uh, Brother Plight was the, the consummate Mason. Uh, whenever anyone talked about masonry or had to refer, Nelson Plight was a, the epitome of masonry. He served in many capacities and uh, served in the Grand Lodge, Grand Lodge lecturer, uh, served uh, in any and all capacities that you can mention. Every house, the Blue House, the Red House, he was either the secretary or he had some kind of input on what was going on. Brother Plight was the one who always would say, you have to be at the table. And if you're at the table, then you can have input and, get, and make decisions. So I, I sort of sat at his feet, and he was my mentor, my brother, and my father-in-law. And uh, we missed him dearly, but Brother Polite was uh, an overachiever. And uh, he always had to be at the top. And uh, that was, that was, he was just that type of guy, and uh, he expected excellence. And uh, I stand here uh, to acknowledge all his accomplishments in the uh, Masonic Lodge. So many things at the table, but we want to end with two very quickly. Tell us very quickly about his civil rights and civil As many liberty. of you know, my father did, um, he was very prominent in the local civil rights struggles of the early 1960s. And uh, this is one of the signs. We used to, we used to march, um, you know, particularly, you know, like at Rocky Springs, they wouldn't allow us to swim because uh, of the color of our skin. Um, and we would go out there and we'd, I'd go with him and we'd march and we'd carry our signs and march around. And also downtown Lancaster, um, we used to march because they wouldn't hire blacks, uh, you know, downtown. So we would march. I can remember doing that. And we also found pictures of, of the marches. Um, so, yeah, this was just one of the, the signs that, that was carried. And we found this. He kept it. <laughs> you know, so I don't know. This sign is quite old, um, but he kept it. And this was, and this was an add-on from... Uh... Lancaster, uh, greater city, of, and we still have the, they had some commemor memorable Coke bottles that have the mayor's name and uh, Brother Blight's name on it. But Brother Blight was out in the community. He loved Lancaster. He always had his little red rose on his lapel. And uh, this was just, you know, the, the highlight of 
of his uh, commitment to the community. He's a good brother, yeah. and we, we miss him dearly. Uh, we're going to end there with one of my, I think, signature favorites of the literally trunks and boxes full of things. His bicycle. No, oh my God. <laughs> with, uh, I can't imagine this distinguished gentleman driving around Lancaster on this bicycle. Could you tell us? I'll tell you about this. He was proud of this bicycle. He said he got it when he was 10 years old. So if he was alive today, he'd be 98. So this bike is like 88 years old. And he kept that thing for years and years and years. It was in the basement. And we, 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 we looked at it, but we didn't, we didn't dump it. Um, so, but this is his bike. And he, he said he had it when he was 10 years old. So, so for our colleagues at the, uh, at the State Archives, as we transition to the brilliant David Carmichael and his team, uh, we have, and again, forgive me for holding this document without gloves on, I should know better. We have so many images where the polite family is in the foreground, but in the background are all kinds of families in the community. And we hope to use some of these images on our website uh, with the caption, do you know who I am? As we begin to try to identify other families in the background of these pictures. Thank you very much, uh, Terry and, uh, Fatty have opened their uh, storage uh, cabin to our history detectives. We've been uh, spending time there, digging into these archives, trying to photograph them. And again, thanks to Randy Harris for photographing all the documents from the families, which we'll put on our website as we begin to build memory boxes for the families to go to the Lancaster Public Library. And now it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce to you David Carmichael, Executive Director of the State Archives, uh, who will uh, scramble some of the questions, some of the anagrams, and some of the provide hints about conservation, restoration, preservation, and interpretation. David Carmichael. Thank you, Lenwood. I appreciate the invitation today, and I'm only going to, to speak for a second because I'm going to turn it over to one of my staff who, uh, as you know, has great expertise in, in this area. But I just want to say that what I've been seeing today is really the stuff of history. And um, it's at the community level that we really get the story of people. And what these records are doing is telling the story of these communities in the words of the community and the words of the people, instead of the state sitting up here and telling the, the story and the, and the history, it is much better coming from the people who lived it and created it. And so what we've been trying to encourage people to do is to capture their history, preserve their history, uh, either by themselves as groups or in cooperation with repositories like the, the library that you're working with. So I'm going to turn it over to one of my terrific staff people, uh, Tyler Stump, who is going to just talk a little bit about what you can do to make sure that these things survive. So thank you for the invitation. And Tyler, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, David. If you'll give me one moment, I'm going to put some slides up on the screen so that if you're watching with a computer screen, you should be able to see them. And if not, I will share these with Lenwood so he can share the slides with everyone afterwards. But um, either way, we'll, uh, we'll get through this. But give me one moment to bring this up. I hope everyone is doing well today. It's very snowy where I am. But you probably all got some snow too. I heard Lancaster got a little bit more than we did. So let's see. Where is my slideshow? Here it is. Okay. So let's put this in full screen. Okay. Hopefully we can all see this okay. If not, I'm sure somebody will let me know. <laughs> um, anyways, so my name is Tyler Stump and I'm an archivist here at the Pennsylvania State Archives over in Harrisburg, so not too far away from Lancaster. Uh, Lenwood was kind enough to invite us, all the State Archives, to come over and speak with you all just about some strategies and tips for managing and saving all kinds of memorabilia. 
Now in the state archives, we typically work with you know, paper documents and written things because we're an archive and not just a museum. Um, so that's my expertise, but we work, we've worked and helped people work with all types of memorabilia and objects and records of, of all sorts. Um, so I think we'll have a little bit, no matter what kinds of things you might have at home, or you know, we've seen a lot of different types of historical objects and materials already today. Um, but either way, I'm, I'm sure that we'll, we'll cover something for everyone. So a lot of the things that I might talk about a little bit today, they might seem like a little bit of common sense for all of us listening, because clearly you have been preserving a lot of your family and community's history for a long time already and have done a great job, clearly. Um, a lot of these things, they're not, they don't just survive on their own. They survive because somebody cares about them and somebody puts them in a place where they're safe or they you know, take care of them, they handle them in the appropriate way. Um, so I, I don't want to act like you haven't done anything, uh, but I think there are a lot of other tips and tricks that they might seem common sense when you hear them, but at the same time, you might never have thought of them in the first place. And that's how it always seems to be for me, where every time I learn something new about preservation, it seems like, well, that was so obvious. Why didn't I think of this before? So hopefully that'll be the same thing for you. When it comes to managing our memorabilia and our historical things, uh, I think it's useful to think about three basic activities that we want to do. We want to gather materials, we want to preserve them, and then we want to share them with others. So I think if we kind of uh, you know, break it down to its essence, this is what we're all trying to do, no matter you know, what it looks like or, or what we're doing in, on one day to the next. So maybe just take a moment and think about your own family and your community's history. And what, what are the things that are worth saving? What tells your family's story or your community's story? And how do you store those things in a way that keeps them safe? so that they'll be around for the next generation and the generation after that. And then finally, how do you share those things with others in meaningful ways? I think that's also really important. That's why we do all this work so that we can share them with others uh, and so that it can impact others. So these are the three things that I, I wanna talk about today in a couple of different ways. So let's take a moment and think about um, our families and our communities and our histories. Just what, what are we, how do we tell their stories? You know, how do we, when we're trying to gather the things of history, what does that mean? Uh, and what kind of material or even immaterial things help us tell these stories and tell this history? Uh, we've already heard from a lot of folks today who have a variety of different materials um, from photographs, from just stories that they remember to, <laughs> we just saw a bicycle and a rifle. So literally we have a wide, wide range of different types of things, which is really great because history comes in many different shapes and forms. And um, so I think that's, we need to just keep on thinking about this and thinking anything can tell history. Anyone can, anything can tell our story. Sometimes people will ask me though, like what's the best way to save my history? Like, should I write it down? Should I have it in photographs? Should I, you know, have an oral history or something like that? And they think it's, it's a particular type of thing or a format. And I don't think that's really the case. I don't think that one thing is better at saving or telling history than anything else. I think the answer is always it depends. Anything can tell your family's history or even just serve as an aid to help you and your family and your community remember its history or remember stories. Uh, here in the state archives, we mostly have written things, um, but you know, we, we preserve one chunk of history and not every part of history. Um, but what we typically have when we're preserving history is uh, letters, journals, maps, books, and photographs, and that sort of thing. Uh, but I know a lot of families don't always have those types of materials, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. Um, their family's history is embedded in lots of other types of things, sometimes even you know, the recipes that they make or the songs they sing or the holidays that they celebrate. Uh, it doesn't have to be a tangible thing necessarily. A family's history can be told just as powerfully through any day-to-day -day object you might have in the home as it could be in a formal thing like a wedding or, or you know, like a marriage certificate or a birth or death certificate or something kind of quote official like that. One of my favorite authors, Zora Neale Hurston, once wrote about some of the memorabilia and objects that she had saved from her childhood and ancestors, which I just wanted to share this quote from with you. She called it her jumble of things priceless and worthless. And she had things including a, a diamond, an empty spool, bits of broken glass, lengths of string, a key to a door long since crumbled away, a rusty knife blade, old shoes saved, and a nail bent under the weight of things too heavy for any nail. 
so these, I, I just always, I think about this quote a lot when people ask me, well, how do we preserve history? And it's, it's anything that conjures up those memories, those stories and the history itself. Um, anything can tell history if it has the right context and stories attached to it. Uh, and these things to some people, to other people who don't know what they mean, they might not mean much, uh, but to us who know and understand their importance, um, that is the history and it is the story. So I think for us, we need to just look for things that preserve our memories and our history and our stories and be ready to save them no matter what they look like or what form they come in. So no matter what you're gathering though, I think it's also important to keep it organized in a way that makes sense to others. And so this is, you know, think about labeling things that you have. Um, you know, if you have papers or photographs, put them maybe in a folder and put a label on the top of that folder that says what's in it or why it's important. Uh, if you have objects and things like that, you can attach tags to them and other things that says what it is, who it belonged to, when it was made, if you know, or how old it is, um, those kinds of things. Um, you and I might know why a coat or a locket or a photograph is important, but our children or you know somebody else who we're sharing things with, they might not. They might not know what the importance or the story behind something is. Uh, and so I think saving the context along with the historical thing or item itself is really important and it makes things better preserved and just more meaningful to other people when we're going to share them in the future. And sometimes you might need to talk to other members of your family, other members of the community and gather that important information from them. So, you know, ask a grandparent who all the people in a photograph are. Lenwood just was speaking about the one photograph he shared a, a few minutes ago and just how we don't know who the people in the background of the photograph are. Um, that's something, you know, when you have a chance, ask someone before it's too late and you're not able to ask again. Um, or ask why, you know, a certain piece of furniture or a keepsake or something, why it was important to somebody or where did it come from? You know, what's, what's the real story behind it? Uh, and write those things down and keep them stored along with the item itself. Uh, it can be useful to ask questions, you know, during and after uh, you have an object or something, and it can just make the, the story and make the object all that more important and valuable. Of course, all of this depends on you know, your situation, what you have, uh, the people that you can ask questions to and things like that. But I just think it's always important, the more context that we can add and save along with our historic treasures and our, our things, our heirlooms, uh, it's always going to be to our benefit and to our, you know, everyone who's going to come after it, after us to their benefit as well. Okay, so we've, let's say we've gathered our historical things, we've saved the context and the stories around them. So that's great. And sometimes I feel like that's the easy part of, of archiving and preservation. The next part of this process is the actual work of saving and preserving things. And sometimes that can be a little harder because this work never ends because we want to save things forever. So we have to kind of constantly always monitor things, always keep them safe, always keep an eye on them. Um, and so, you know, by itself, nothing will last forever. That's just the way things are. Uh, and I think, you know, we all need to take active steps to ensure that our things will remain in good shape and will be around after each of us is gone. And I think everyone who's spoken already today has shared things that are in remarkable shape considering their age and where they've been and where they've come from. Uh, and that's just so exciting to see. And, um, you know, we're just, we're, I think we're all just thankful that these things are around to see today. Uh, and I think the idea behind preservation is just making sure that we're doing everything we can now so that we won't, um, you know, we don't want to have issues or, or when things are fragile, we just don't want to put them, the items in a position where there's more vulnerabilities or more, you know, threats to damaging them or losing them uh, in any case in the future. At the State Archives, we like to say that you should treat your family records and memorabilia and your other things like you would a dear old elderly aunt in your family. Uh, and we actually made a little comic book on this uh, a few years ago to talk about preservation. Uh, and we, we created a character named Aunt Edna, who's like an old elderly aunt in the family. Uh, and we used her to illustrate this idea. So we say, you know, treat all of your things like you would your Aunt Edna. And so I'll have a couple of photos that I'll, I'll look at in the next couple of slides. But what we mean by that is um, a lot of preservation and the best practices and methods that we do in the archives and that, you know, we can all do as well. Uh, a lot of them are common sense. Treat things like you would treat a human being, you know, put them in places that are comfortable and, you know, controlled and are safe and the kinds of places 
um, where things are less likely to be damaged or are harmed in any sort of way. Um, and that way we can uh, avoid any kind of unnecessary chances or risks that can come to our things. The environment where you store things is really important, obviously, for preservation. Avoid storing things in attics or basements where it can be very hot or very cold, depending on the time of the year. Uh, you know, a lot of us, we live in Pennsylvania where we have cold winters and hot summers, and it's a really bad thing for any kind of old or antique item to go through those temperature fluctuations, hot, cold, hot, cold. Um, that is kind of, it's good for mold to grow on things. It's good for moisture to get on things. It can cause a lot of problems down the road. So let's try and avoid that. Um, store things, you know, in another place in the house, which is a little more comfortable and temperature controlled, uh, a place where there are less risks for moisture and humidity. Um, you know, don't store things in your pipes or other places where water is present. Um, when things are stored out of sight and out of mind, that's when bad things are more likely to happen to them. So just like you wouldn't put a family member in the basement, uh, try not to store things there when, when you can. Sometimes an attic or a basement might be the only place where you can store things. And if that's the case, um, that's okay. It's, you know, it's what you have, you use what you have available, um, but still just try and keep things off the floor if you can. Uh, try and keep them away from you know, sources of heat, like if you have a radiator or a boiler, um, try and keep them away from water if you have any pipes or you know, uh, sinks or anything like that. Um, typically, water and moisture are going to be the main culprits when it comes to damaged historical materials. Uh, that's true in the state archives and it's true in a lot of museums. Um, so really, water and moisture are, are the things we really want to watch out for. No matter where in the house or anywhere else that you're storing records though, it's important, like I said before, to control the temperature and humidity. Um, and so we typically recommend you keep things stored in a climate around 70 degrees Fahrenheit and then around a relative humidity of 35 to 45%. So that's generally what we wanna have uh, in the room where we have our records and our artifacts and our objects. Try to keep your objects and your other materials out of the sun, especially if they're not stored in boxes or anything else that covers them. Um, I'm sure all of us have seen an old newspaper that's turned brown and brittle over the years. And that typically happens because of light damage or um, kind of just light fading. Uh, you can also prevent light damage and fading by keeping, if you have framed objects or things that are just out kind of on their own, um, keep them or walls or surfaces that are away from windows that the sunlight will come through into the room or just use curtains or other things like that just to limit the light that is on these things for as much of the time as you can. Uh, you can never keep a storage area too clean. I don't think there, there is any way to do that. There's, there's always more that we can do and it, that's always going to help with preservation of our things. Storing materials in good sturdy boxes and folders, uh, that also gives things an extra layer of protection. Uh, we're always just trying to put as many things between our objects and our materials and the outside world as we can. Um, and sometimes people ask me, well, I don't know what, what supplies, what boxes should I get and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of people who sell arch archival supplies and they say Ar archives grade or you know preservation friendly boxes or things like that. And sometimes that's not always the case. So I generally recommend um, if you're buying any kinds of supplies, look for something that says acid free on it. That's usually a really good indicator that it's good quality. Um, there's a lot of paper based products that have, they're, they're more acidic. So it just means the chemicals that are made to use to make that box or that folder, um, it can degrade the things inside it if it's left alone for years and years on end. Um, so acid free is really the term that you wanna look for. And if you're not sure, give us a call at the State Archives, call your local historical society. Uh, there are a lot of folks around there who preservation is our, you know, that's what we do day after day. Um, so we've been more than happy to give you recommendations or advice if you ever have questions about that. If you ever have loose objects, especially small ones like single sheets of paper or, you know, individual small items and objects, it's a good idea to store them in containers where they can move around less uh, they're less likely to be moved or bumped or knocked over or damaged in any way. And when you're putting things in folders and boxes, make sure you don't cram them full because we don't want things pressed against each other. Uh, we want to give them a little bit of breathing room on the inside. A couple of folks today have shared that they have books and other you know, older bound volumes and things like that. Uh, these are also great things to share and tell our history. 
uh, if you have books or albums or you know fragile volumes or other things like that, uh, we usually recommend store them on their ends if the spines are in good condition like I have here in the photograph. Uh, but a lot of times the covers of things can be damaged or worn over the years, so just be careful with them. Uh, the covers of books and other bound objects, they really protect all the contents inside, and that's what's really important. Uh, the pages on the inside and not necessarily the, the cover on the outside. But if you do have bound objects and you have either a broken spine or something that's um, it's not quite as sturdy as it once was just because, you know, the toll of the years has taken on it, uh, we recommend it's best to store it flat or even put those things in a box on their own where they'll be safer. Um, because a lot of times the pages that are attached to the spine itself, the more damage that comes to that part of the book, it can still damage things and then pages can break or tear. Uh, and so that's what we want to avoid. So kind of protecting the spine of a book is always a good thing. We saw from a couple of folks already today that they have larger things like posters and maps and large photographs and things like that. Uh, these are also, they're really exciting things, but they can sometimes pose um, a little more of a challenge for preservation. But if you have larger things like maps and posters and things, store them flat when you can, where you have them in the house and avoid folding them as much as you can. Uh, and if you don't have a place to keep them stored flat, it's always best to roll them and store them in tubes. Um, and you can also find acid-free archival tubes. That's a thing that you can usually buy um, in office supply stores and in places like that. They're not too hard to find on the internet for sale as well. Uh, I know a lot of folks and a lot of families have kept scrapbooks over the years. I know my family uh, and my family's lived in York County just across the river from you all for, you know, 10 generations as far, as far back as we've been able to trace. And we have several very old scrapbooks that the family kept, which are really exciting, but also very fragile. Um, beware of scrapbooks just from a preservation perspective. The paper that's usually used in, in typical scrapbooks that are sold is lower quality and also it's um, it's often highly acidic, which means that um, the pages or the paper itself will degrade pretty quickly as opposed to other kinds of paper. Typically people are pasting things into scrapbooks as well. So uh, the, at, the adhesive is going to damage things over time. So another thing to watch out for. Um, we typically re recommend just handle these as carefully as you possibly can and even you might want to consider photographing or scanning the pages, and that way it's easier to share without having to handle the scrapbook every time you want to take it out and show it to someone. And then you can keep it in storage. Nowadays, a lot of our history and stories are being created and stored electronically, and we could spend all day just talking about electronic and digital records. Uh, and I know I only have a limited amount of time, uh, but I just want to just have us all think about you know, 30, 40 years ago, we used to have records and floppy disks and microfilm and eight tracks, and that's how we stored things. You know, today, all of these things are obsolete and nobody makes them anymore. Now we have CDs and DVDs and external hard drives and things staved in the cloud, wherever the cloud is. Uh, and who knows what things will be like in 20 or even 50 years from now. So if you do have things that are saved digitally, which a lot of us do uh, for today and, you know, the last 10 years or so, um, just keep track of them, you know, save multiple copies of things. So that way, uh, if one of them accidentally gets deleted or lost, you've still got the other one. Um, try and convert things to newer formats when you can. Um, you know, a lot of us still probably have some VHS tapes at home, but there aren't a lot of VCRs. Um, you know, it's getting to be the time where we want to convert that to a, a, a more modern format so that we know it'll be around and that people can access it in the future. Uh, when we think about three-dimensional objects and artifacts that we have at the home, we need to, from a preservation perspective, we want to think about what they're made out of because that will kind of dictate what the best preservation methods are for it. Is it made out of wood or plastic or metal or some kind of fabric or textile or something like that? Each of these have their own special um, kind of best practices that are used for each of them. Um, and each of them is kind of unique in their own regard. So we usually recommend, you know, once you've figured out what something is made out of, then you can go and do the research, what's the best way to take care of it? Or you can, you know, call an archive or a historical society and tell them, I have, you know, a ceramic thing, please tell me how I can take care of this. Uh, but the material is really important to consider with a lot of our objects. When we clean objects, because things get dusty or tarnished or dirty over the years, um, you know, 
just we want to be as slow and as gentle as we can always, you know, no matter what we're cleaning. Um, but when we're, we're cleaning things, a lot of times less is more. We don't want to do too much and avoid. Uh, we want to try to avoid accidentally damaging things as we clean them. Um, and that can be things like avoiding using commercial cleaning products because a lot of times they have solvents and other chemicals that can harm our historical objects in them. Uh, we want to, you know, don't we want to press lightly on things as we clean them or brush them off uh, because pressure or, you know, jostling things is, is another thing that can risk damage. When we're cleaning objects, you know, wear cotton gloves if you can um, and just, you know, use nice clean supplies and things like that as much as you can. Um, like I said before, a lot of this is common sense. Just go slow and just be very careful and you're probably going to be okay. Um, you know, a lot of these things, typically the, the things that we keep that are historical are, are fairly durable uh, and they've held up over the years. But at the same time, the more we can do to be gentle with them is always going to be better. The slide I have here is a little cluttered. I just have a lot of advice for lots of different material types and how to take care of them. Uh, but like I said, I'll share this with Lenwood so he can distribute it. Um, but just like I said before, pay attention to what the material is. And then you can kind of go from there to figure out the best way to care for and to clean those objects to make sure that they, they're staying in good condition. Uh, but in general, no matter what it is, just be gentle, be careful, and go slow. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and when you're storing and cleaning and handling historical memorabilia and other materials, just think about what could cause damage to this? What are the risks? And I have a lot of them up here. You know, um, fire and water we talked about, maybe accidentally damaging something while you're cleaning it, pests, light, temperature and humidity, just handling things and accidentally jostling it when we're transporting it. Um, just being proactive and thinking about what are the risks to the things that we have and how can we prevent them or maybe mitigate them at the very most that's always going to be a good idea. So that's always something we can always do more. We can always just think about that as much as we can. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me again, I just want to talk a little briefly because I know I only have a few more minutes, but just how do we share and provide access to the things that we've been saving? Uh, the whole reason that we gather and preserve our things is so that people in the future can see them and benefit from them, right? We don't just want to do all this work so that things sit in storage forever, because that's that's not why we do history. History is to you know share things with people in a meaningful meaningful way. Um, you know, think about taking photographs of what you have, or making copies of them, and sharing them with family members and other folks who might be interested. And I know Lenwood, you are well on your way to doing that, and with a lot of the things that we have here in Lancaster. But just for anyone else who's listening, if you haven't photographed your things yet, um, now is the best time to start making copies and sharing them with the things that you have. Uh, you know, make inventories or lists of what you have. So that way in the future, you know, it's, you don't have to go rifling through boxes again to figure out what's in there uh, and it'll be easier to find things. So always try and make things easier to share as much as you can. When people, and maybe not just you, but maybe other family members, maybe other people you're with, when you're looking at and handling objects, like we said before, just be as careful as you can when you're handling them and allowing others to handle them. Um, you know, look at the object or the record or the photograph, whatever it is before you do anything. Uh, and just make sure it's it's safe to, to pick it up and to handle it safely. Uh, because sometimes some things are fragile or, or something could happen to them if you pick it up, you know, in a, in a way that might not be the best for it. Uh, make sure your hands are clean before you pick things up. You know, if an object has moving parts or is in several pieces, uh, be aware of that and making sure you're picking it up in a, in a safe way or something like that. Uh, again, just take your time and just don't rush. Um, you know, I, I think some people, especially in today's day and age, they just want to take pictures of things and put them on the internet and then maybe not save the original. I think some of us had a little heart attack when I said that out loud. You know, we have to save the originals, I think. I, I think having that kind of physical connection to the past is so important and really getting our hands on history is so much more meaningful than, than you know, just looking at a, a copy of a photograph or something a lot of the time. Uh, and I think that's what we need to do. But at the same time, we need to be mindful of what do we need to do physically while we're handling these things to make sure that they'll always be safe and that they'll always uh, be preserved for future generations. So when we share things and we, we're accessing them, we just have to make sure that we keep preservation and, and safekeeping in the back of our brain at, at all times. So 
I'm going to stop there because I know I'm right about on time. I've got my email address and my phone number right up here for me at the State Archives. Um, if you ever have questions about anything, just a, a good way to take care of something that you might have or, or you know, any other questions about preservation and, and those sorts of things, I'd be more than happy to chat with you. Uh, preservation is what I do professionally all day, every day. So uh, I always enjoy talking with folks who have the things that are worth preserving and I love to hear about them. So please, um, please, please, uh, please keep us in mind for the future. Um, but I'll leave it there. And if anyone has any questions or anything for me now, or just anything you'd like to share, I'm all ears. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Tyler. I uh, really appreciate the archives. We will post with Tyler's permission, his uh, PowerPoint on our website, which is monumentpaus.com monumentpaus.com. But now we have a few more minutes and we'll ask those of you who have joined us virtually to consider the archives and the artifacts that you may have in your personal collection to also talk to your family, your siblings, your extended family, your community about articles and objects and artifacts that they may have to build your story like a jigsaw puzzle, but we have time in the room. If you're, if you join us digitally, please put your question in the chat. We will make sure that we get an answer for your, your question. Be sure also to put your email address so we can send the answer. If you have a question from one of the families or from the state archives, we'll be sure to answer. But for my guests, both uh, virtual and in the room. We'll go about the room and uh, I'll ask each family if they have one or two questions that they would like to uh, address to the archives. And I'm going to start with Steve Geisenberger. So uh, my question to the archivist uh, is, I have a number of scrapbooks and I think you addressed them briefly. Uh, but how would you go about, I mean, it, you know, taking pictures of pictures, uh, is there a better way to scan or then, you know, if you don't have a, if you don't have a, 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 a great scanner, uh, what would you recommend doing, uh, especially if you want to not do them one by one and, mm -hmm. and, uh, how, how expensive is it to hire an archivist to, to do the work? That's a, that's a good question. And I, I, scrapbooks are, they're like the archivist's best friend and nightmare at the same time because they're so great with so many valuable things in them and memories, but at the same time, just physically, they, they pose a lot of issues, you know, for preservation. Um, in terms of, of photographing it, if you have a nice high quality, um, you know, camera and that, that, that can still be good, but I, I know a lot of times, especially if there's photographs in it, especially glossy photographs, it seems like no matter what angle you're taking a picture, there's always like that shiny spot on the photograph and you can't really get a good photo. Um, so, you know, depending on what is in the scrapbook itself, um, photography isn't always a good way to capture that. Um, so I definitely recommend, I usually recommend checking with your local historical society or public library. I know that the State Library of Pennsylvania has a program across the state um, where they have scanning technology and, and equipment that's available for, you know, people in the community to come and use. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure exactly what's in Lancaster specifically, but I know Lancaster History, which is the historical society, um, they have, you know, top of the line equipment, which is right there in Lancaster City, um, which I believe that, you know, folks from the community can come in when they have historical materials like yours. Um, so I definitely encourage you to, you know, start and see what you can find kind of locally around you. And then if you're uh, not finding anything, you can always give me a call and I can see if we know somebody in the area who can help out. Um, but yeah, that's with scrapbooks, they're tricky because you don't wanna just, you know, take the Xerox copier and put your scrapbook upside down and just, you know, scan away because that's gonna damage the thing. Um, so we always wanna be extra careful. So I'd say, um, look around and see if there's somebody who's done something like this before and start with them. And for the families who are working with us, Steve, 
with Memories at the Crossroads, we will be working with Pennsylvania College of Arts and Design, PCAD, and also with F&M's digital program in the spring. And with your contact, our historians, uh, uh, to digitize the items that you've brought to the table today. We won't be able to do your whole collection, but we will be able to be sure to, to digitize the items. And of course, again, the uh, expertise of Randy Harris uh, to photograph the families. I believe uh, uh, Brian and Kim, are the Lafayette here? Would the Lafayette like to ask a question? No, I, I think we are good. Uh, Tyler's presentation was very good. It will help us to move forward with uh, all our scrapbook activities. Uh, and uh, Nelson Polite Jr., do you have a question that you'd like to ask the um, archivist or the state? I think, I think I missed when you went over about plastic containers. Mm -hmm. Could you go over that for me again, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I talked a little bit about just the containers that we store materials in. Um, and it's it's generally our recommendation. There isn't one type of container that's, that's yeah. the best necessarily. Um, but we generally say um, looking for sturdy materials, things that won't crush is going to be good because sometimes if, if weight accidentally gets on top of a container, it can crush or smash the things that are inside it. We obviously want to avoid that. Um, but, you know, anything, especially things that have lids that are sealed is going to be good. Um, we typically recommend if you're buying new boxes or containers or supplies, look for ones that say they are acid free. That's the, the phrase that we're looking for. That's just, um, it means that the material the container is made out of the chemicals and the things that's in it won't leach out onto the contents inside. Um, and so if you are, I'm sure most of us, we already have containers and boxes that we store our things and you might not know what they're made out of. Um, and that's okay, but just if you're getting new things, acid-free is the thing you wanna look for. Um, but you have plastic um, like bins and buckets and things like that. I know lots of folks who store things in those kinds of containers and, and those things are in really good condition. Um, so generally, you're okay with that. But yeah, if you're looking for new boxes and new containers, look for something that says acid-free when you're at the store. I hope that helps. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you. Very helpful. No problem. Pat, yeah, we had a question on the preservation of the bike. Uh, what, what's your position on that? Should we get that uh, restored or leave it in its uh, present state? That's a good question. I've been thinking about that ever since uh, the camera panned over and I got to see that bike. You know, I'm of two minds and, and I'll, bear in mind, I, I'm an archivist, so I don't specialize in, in objects like this, especially ones that are, you know, you have lots of different components. You've got metal. Um, I, it looks like there's rubber there. There might be some fabric on the seat and things like that. Um, so it's, it's a complicated thing. And I, I'm not sure, exactly sure what kind of condition it's in. Um, restoration you know, that, and I know there's a lot of like TV shows where people go and restore things and they look shiny and new again. It, it depends on how you feel about that. Because when you, if you restore it, it won't, it might lose some of its character. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it, it will be the same bike that, you know, has been in the family, but it will be a different bike in a way. I think that's kind of a existential thing. Uh, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm a preservationist, not a philosopher. So I don't want to go down that road. Um, if you do want to restore it, though, you know, I would recommend making sure that you're finding somebody who really knows what they're doing. Talk with them, like ask them, are you going to replace parts? Are you going to clean parts? Because that's a, you know, a very different thing. And some restorationists will go and, you know, they might find, um, you know, parts from the same era or the same time period to replace it, or they might find modern parts. And of course, that's a difference, too. Um, and so this looks like it's in good shape. Obviously, you're able to transport it here in one piece. Um, so it, it looks like it's something as long as you kind of keep storing it in a good way, it's going to be okay. Um, if you ever wanted to ride it again, or if you ever were interested in some kind of restoration, um, I think that's a, a route you can take, but it's just something to, you know, put some thought into it before you go down that road. I have one more question in reference to uh, Brother Play had a plethora of pictures 
and he had negatives. What, what should we do with the negatives? I would definitely say, oh, don't get rid of the negatives because that's those are just as valuable as photographs. Um, here in the archives, I would say, I don't know what the percentage, but at least 45% of our photograph collections are negatives. Um, you really want to make sure you're avoiding light exposure with them where you have them stored. And that's just, it's going to damage them far more um, than the, the photograph prints that you have. Um, but other than that, you know, you can generally just store them along with photographs in the same place. Um, just make sure you're handling them with gloves or something. You know, the oils in our, in our skin and our hands can damage photographs and negatives especially. Um, a fingerprint on a negative, just because a negative is smaller, is going to damage a larger area of the image than it would on a larger print. So just being extra careful with that. Um, and just making sure that you label them well so you know what the negative is. Because uh, you, know, you can kind of hold it up to the light and see what it is, but it's a lot harder. So having a label on that will, um, will help you a lot. And the other thing, I know here in the state archives, we have scanners where we can scan a negative and then on this computer screen, we can see it like it was a developed photograph. And I know a lot of other historical societies and libraries can do the same thing. So I would recommend um, if you ever have a chance, go and get them scanned somewhere where they can um, reverse the image on the computer so you can see what it would look like. Um, because a lot of older negatives, um, it can damage them if you're trying to develop them like you would you know, back in the day. So those would be the, the things I would want you to think about for that. I would suggest that uh, Terry and Patty contact Recycled Bison in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They restore, repair, and maintain historical bicycles as well as repair and decorate bicycles. And the folks at Recycled Bicycle, um, for the Lafayette's and for the polite uh, and Dixon family, I would suggest that you contact Regalia uh, Tosti. Don't be concerned about the word Tosti. Tosti means to redeem the heart. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now, yes, yes. 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 Regalia in Columbia uh, is a uh, heritage and Victorian uh, wardrobe and costume house that repairs 19th century and Civil War era costumes. And I would suggest that, for example, for the coats here, because they're made of different fabrics than contemporary dry cleaners, one of the questions was, should they be dry cleaned? I, I'd say either Millersville, or Shippensburg's costume departments that have uh, folks who repair and restore period clothing or regalia. Uh, actually, we have a couple of other slides that uh, if you'll pop them up really quickly and we'll say goodbye. I think we have a couple of other resources. Uh, if not one is a, a new article that you can google about how to maintain your digital collections and with so much digitization uh now the question is how do we maintain digital records uh thanks to the state archives uh very special thanks to our uh, History Detectives in Harrisburg and our Maud Coleman Research Group, who we lovingly call the Maud Squad in uh, Lancaster for their work with the families. We will continue that work. Uh, those of you who are with us digi uh, digitally or virtually, put your questions in the 
chat room and we'll try to comb out your questions and or your suggestions. And finally, if you contact the uh, Pennsylvania Genealogical Society and Dr. Sharon Martin uh, with a really great uh, set of workshops across the central Pennsylvania on genealogy and work and, and research. Thank you to Steven Geisinger. Uh, thank you to the Lothia family. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hopkins for bringing uh, Mr. Beams uh, to our attention and very special thanks to Nelson Polite Jr. and Patty Polite Dixon and Terry Dixon for letting us enter their home and their, their collection uh, at the drop of a dime, you know, you know, and uh, we uh, want to remind you that January 15th, which is next Saturday, we will do a special live and learn session on the Emancipation Proclamation. On January 15th, 1863, the people of Harrisburg's Old Eighth Ward convened a meeting of African American leaders across Pennsylvania to write a response to Abraham Lincoln from the free people of Pennsylvania about the Emancipation Proclamation. And next Saturday, on the anniversary of that day, we will have scholars, humanists, and educators on the Emancipation Proclamation speak on the relevance of that document as a tool for the current civil rights struggle. So until then, dig out those family artifacts, start writing down those stories, share those stories with us, and build your memory boxes. God bless you till we meet again, and we will say goodbye for now. Thank you.